I know, I know, you might be surprised you're saying, Bob, that doesn't look like a sukkah. And you're right, you're right, because it rained overnight. It's raining again this morning. Actually, my sukkah blew over. I've never had that before. <laughs> I've never experienced this. I mean, cinder blocks, 12 cinder blocks. How in the world could the wind, well, it was, it was that, was that strong last night. So it blew it down. And I started to repair it this morning and then it rained on me. So I said, I'll do that in just a little while. I've got to get on Facebook Live. So we're going to read in the sukkah inside my house. It's right outside there. It's right there, but it's all right. So what do you do in the sukkah? You read and you eat. And some people sleep and some people watch television. I didn't take a TV out there. I. The only screen I have is this one that I'm talking to you on, and uh, and no, I don't watch television on it. Now, it would be a test if the Kansas City Chiefs were playing and I had to watch and be in the sukkah, but I can negotiate time a little better with that. All right, so <laughs> um, I just, I've, I've been getting all kinds of comments from you, and I am really grateful for those. Um, to find out what you're hearing and what you're processing as we deal with Sukkot. Some of you are learning all kinds of facts about the Jewish holiday. Um, there was a quote that um, is in the book of Amos, the prophet Amos, and it's pretty remarkable in light of what happened to me overnight. And it's in chapter 9. It's quoted both here in the Older Testament and in the Newer Testament, which I find very interesting. It says, um, <clears throat> Amos, I love this. It's in verse 11. In that day I will raise up the fallen sukkah, or booth, of David and wall up its breaches. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. So this is a, a citation of the, well, it's a talk about the restoration of the Jewish people, restoration of Israel after the captivity. That's the prophecy. And sure enough, that is what happened, at least for another few hundred years. And then we were exiled yet again. But this idea of raising up the fallen booth of David is actually quoted in the Brit Chadashah, which is maybe surprising to some of you. And where it was quoted is in the Council of Jerusalem. This is when the leadership gathered. So the, the community of faith, nicknamed the church, had been going full steam for 14 chapters, uh, however many years that was. And the Jerusalem community was growing and other places there in the land of Israel. And then the Apostle Paul and all his entourage were making headway in, um, in Asia Minor, or what's called Turkey today. And sorry for the bells. They're going off here a few minutes late. <clears throat> it's eight o'clock in the morning uh, where, where I am. I don't know where you are. Uh, so the community of faith is growing, Asia Minor, and a lot of not just Jewish people, but non-Jewish people are coming to faith as well. Now the, the folks back in Jerusalem say, Oi, what are we going to do with all these Goyim for Jesus? So they had a council uh, like we had in Yavne in 90 CE, uh, like councils happen throughout history. So it's government, it's religion, it's politic, it's all of that. And they came together and said, what are we going to do? Do they have to be circumcised? Do Gentiles have to be circumcised? Do they have to keep Torah? And on and on. And so here it is, James's judgment after, in verse number 13 in the book of Acts chapter 15, it says this, after they had stopped speaking, <laughs> I can just imagine, what, there was actually a moment, a lull? Okay, and James, that's Yaakov, answered and said, Brothers, listen to me. Shimeon has uh, related how God first 
concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. That's the Jews. With this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, and it quotes Amos 9. After these things, I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, <clears throat> who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, he said, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, that, uh, but that we write to them that they abstain from four things, from things uh, contaminated by idols, from fornication, from what is strangled, and from blood, meaning foods uh, with the blood without being drained. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him, since he is read in the synagogues every Shabbat. So this quote from Amos about a fallen sukkah, and that's, the context is that my sukkah fell over. Never had that before. Um, and I'll rebuild it. I'll, I'll put it back up. I've already set the, the cinder blocks. They're back up. They're solid. The wooden two by fours are solid. So it, it won't be long and it'll be back up properly. I've got people coming over tonight. Jewish people are coming over uh, to celebrate Shabbat in the sukkah. And if it rains, we'll come inside. We'll have a, we'll be all right. And we'll look at the sukkah and we'll shake our lulav and etrog, we'll be okay. But if it clears up and they say it's just 20% chance, that, that means 80% chance that it won't be raining. Or it means two out of every 10 raindrops are wet. I'm not quite sure what they mean by that. So when we gather, it'll be Jewish people who will consider that we should rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. This is chanted, by the way, in Birkat Hamazon, the Grace After Meals as well. Um, it's kind of neat how this is so important. It's not only a prophecy from the uh, Jewish Bible, from the, the Hebrew scriptures, but also from the Newer Testament, where they draw from it and say, God wants all the nations to come in. Now, we started talking about that yesterday in light of Sukkot, that there were 70 bulls offered by the Jewish people. That's one for every nation. Um, and in Zechariah, this is one more Older Testament quote that I'm going to give you today, and then we're going to read Ecclesiastes, as is our custom. Zechariah, you might have said, and it's chapter 14. God will battle Jerusalem's foes. This is pretty exciting stuff. Uh, the end of any prophet is always exciting. Um, I've been studying Habakkuk on my own and finding it rich. And the end of that is, is really great. But here we go. So Zechariah or Zechariah chapter 14. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women uh -oh, ravished, and half of the city, this is terrible, exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fights on a day of battle. Boy, you don't want to be on the wrong side when God says, I'm going to battle against against one nation or another. On that day, uh, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, that's in Jerusalem, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And I don't know if you've been to Jerusalem, certainly the Mount of Olives right up the hill from the eastern gate is a, a prestigious place. It's the greatest place to be buried because Messiah is going to come through the eastern gate. So you want to be there at the resurrection. That's that's why so many, and I mean the prices for those plots, you could plots from what it is. And the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. That's outrageous. You know, most fault lines in the globe, you can ask seismologists, you know, call your local seismology club and say, in what direction do most fault lines run? 
and they'll say that the majority, the way, the, way over the top, are the the fault lines run north south. So if a an earthquake happened, then east would go this way and west would go that way. But that's not the way it was uh, here. And what have they discovered? Seismologists have discovered under the Mount of Olives an east west fault line. Uh, now, who could have known that? Zachariah was not a graduate of the Jerusalem Seismology uh, University. So what does it say? Verse 5, you'll flee by the valley of my mountains, uh, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord, my God, will come and all the holy ones with him. I don't know what that's going to look like. But at the very culmination of time, God somehow will himself appear and all the saints, meaning all the Older Testament and Newer Testament followers of God will be there. This is pretty great. In that day, there'll be no light. The luminaries will dwindle. He's talking about the sun and the moon. So nature will change. Not only will we have an earthquake in Jerusalem and, and God will fight for his own namesake, against all the nations who fight against Jerusalem, but there'll be no more light, not the natural lights that we know, for it will be a unique day, I'd say, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but it will come about that at evening, uh, there will be light. So something's gonna change right then. And in that day, in that day, Living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the Eastern Sea and the other half toward the Western Sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. So whenever it happens, buckle your seatbelt. This is going to be awesome. And what else is going to be happening in verse 9? And the Lord will be king over all the earth. And that day the Lord will be one and his name one. And, and we sing that at the end of uh, major prayer services, certainly in the Musaf and lots of other times. Uh, yeah, it's going to be great. So there's lots more happening. But look at verse number, I mean, I could read more, but I want to get to Ecclesiastes. Uh, but look what it says in verse 16. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. So there are consequences to not observing the Feast of Sukkot. By whom? By the nations of the world. So this isn't just, as we've been saying, this is not a holiday only for Jewish people. This is a holiday for anybody. It's a holiday for everybody because God has always wanted, not religion, he doesn't, he's not concerned whether you build the sukkah and it doesn't fall over or it does. What he's always wanted is a relationship with you individually and then nationally. He wants people to know him, to celebrate him, to rejoice. This is called Zaman Simchatenu, the time of our rejoicing. So let me quickly read Ecclesiastes 5, <clears throat> and then we're going to call it a day, because we've sure covered a lot of territory just because my sukkah fell over. Guard your steps as you go to the house of God, and draw near to listen, rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they don't know that they're doing evil. Don't be hasty in word, or impulsive in thought, to bring up a matter in the presence of God, for God is in heaven, and you're on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. This is about prayer and having religion and impressing anybody. For the dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool comes through many words. When you make a vow to God, don't be late in paying it for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It's better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. That makes perfect sense. 
Yeshua taught that, didn't he? There are two sons, one who said yes and didn't do it, and one who said no and then did. Which one's better? Obviously the latter. Don't let your speech cause you to sin, and don't say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For in many dreams and in many words there is emptiness. Rather, fear God. If you, <clears throat> sorry, if you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness in the province, don't be shocked at the sight, for one official watches over another official, and there are higher officials over them. After all, a king who cultivates the field is an advantage to the land. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. Boy, isn't that true? Uh, they asked, was it Rockefeller? Yeah, they asked Rockefeller, the, the, the original one, um, how much money do you need? And he said, just a little more. <laughs> yeah. He who loves abundance, um, let's see. All who, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. I mean, the, King Solomon has told us time and time and time again here in this book that if you're living for anything except God, it's going to be a big waste. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what's the advantage to their owners except to look on? The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. The more you have, the more you want. Solomon wrote in the Proverbs, riches makes itself wings and flies away. <laughs> there is a grievous task, oh sorry, there is, it's, here we go, verse 13, there's a grievous evil which I've seen under the sun, remember that phrase, meaning in the natural or where God isn't, <laughs> riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. When those riches were lost through a bad investment and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing to support him. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. There's that cycle of monotony of life, which he's pinged over and over again. So will he return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. What do they say? There's no, uh, there's no uh, pickup. There's no, it's a caravan um, at the back of a hearse. This also is a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus will he die. So what's the advantage to him who, call, who toils for the wind? Throughout his life, he also eats in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. Your occupation is not going to satisfy you. Your riches are not going to satisfy you. Your, all your trivial pursuits are just that. Hmm. There is what I have seen, here is what I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat and drink and enjoy oneself in all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life, which God has given him, for this is his reward. If you're not gonna live for God, eat, drink, and be merry. That's all you've got. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God, for he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. That's chapter five of the book of Ecclesiastes. That's what we do. We, <laughs> what do you do on, on Sukkot? We build this thing, we eat in the thing, we read in the thing, some sleep in there, and mostly we remember God and the vanity of life, the impermanence of life. What are you remembering today? Put your comments, please, in the, in the video, uh, under the video there on Facebook, and I will be happy to read those, and you can comment on each other's comments. That's a good way to go. I wish you a, a, a Shabbat Shalom. Tonight begins uh, day six of Sukkot, and it's also Shabbat. You always have at least one Shabbat, on Feast of Tabernacles. Tonight is ours, and um, it's going to be a joy. We're gathering, we're going to 
have a couple of uh, Jewish ladies baptized this afternoon, later, and then we'll gather here at the house and celebrate what God has done in us and maybe even through us. All right, shalom.